Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Bob McLeod, a penciler and inker from uh, Marvel and DC Comics. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Now, Bob, um, we spoke a little bit uh, this past um, June at the Heroes Con in Charlotte. Um, and we talked briefly about uh, your involvement with New Mutants, which was the first X-Men spinoff. And I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit, uh, again, how you got started uh, with New Mutants and how that book sort of, um, you know, I, I remember the book coming out and it being a, a huge hit. So how that sort of uh, made you feel as your artwork was appreciated by a very large audience. <laughs> well, I did an issue of the X-Men. Uh, there, there was an issue by James Sherman, X-Men 151, where he, for whatever reason, uh, ran behind schedule and couldn't finish the book, so they called me in to finish up the penciling on that issue. And they liked that job and let me pencil their next issue, X-Men 152. And they said, well, you know, this is, this is great. Um, we need a new penciler for the X-Men. If you want to do that, you're, you're welcome to do that. But we also are thinking of a new spinoff of the X-Men. Um, we haven't got a title for it yet, but uh, you could be a uh, co-creator on that and work with Chris Claremont and um, kind of get it on the ground floor. You know, your choice. What would you rather do? And I really wanted to draw the X-Men, but uh, <laughs> I couldn't pass up an opportunity to start a new series. And it sounded like a lot of fun, a, a whole new team of younger X-Men who would be in the Professor Xavier School learning to use their powers and um, be more of a, uh, a, a group of kids who happened to discover they had superpowers rather than just another superhero team. And uh, the idea was to have them more multicultural, uh, more multi-ethnic than uh, previous teams, um, which was fairly uh, new for comics at that time, and um, so it was great. So we, we did that, came out. As I was working on the first issue, actually, um, they said, you know, we've got this new line of graphic novels starting up, and uh, we're thinking of, uh, we're looking for projects that we can turn into graphic novels. I think we're going to do the New Mutants. And I said, well, okay, but the the script I was given for the comic book was like five months ahead of schedule and I could have done my absolute best work on it, whereas the graphic novels were a month behind schedule <laughs> and suddenly I was late on my book <laughs> of a new series and this was my first regular series, so I wasn't really prepared to just pump out pages that quickly. Um, so I had to really rush on that graphic novel and um, actually uh, had to work through my honeymoon to do the inking uh, on the graphic novel or they were going to give it to somebody else. So it was a bit of a, a rough start and actually as, as I was working on the New Mutants um, I got very little feedback uh, from the fans. I mean I knew it was a, a big deal, a new, a new series, but I wasn't, it wasn't like I was getting fan mail or getting a lot of uh, response uh, from a lot of the fans. I, I was somewhat working in the dark as, as far as how the book was being received while I was actually on it. Well, it, it seems today a lot of the creators are working on books um, and they fall behind the deadline, but it seems like Marvel was giving you, uh, you said about five months at the beginning of the project uh, before they asked you to do that graphic novel. Is that sort of the lead time you would have on a book like that? No, that was it, was, it was basically unscheduled. They were kind of thinking of somewhere down the road in a few months. Um, I don't remember if five months was the actual number, but it was basically they hadn't put it on the schedule yet. What they normally do is schedule things three months ahead. Um, it takes a month to pencil, a month to ink, a month to go through editorial. So basically they try to do the books three months ahead of time um, most of the time. Okay, I believe we have uh, some artwork, uh, your cover for New Mutants number one that we are going to show our audience. Um, and the one thing that I, I've often thought about your artwork is that you have a very realistic style. And I know that um, uh, a lot of artists, especially someone like a, a Jack Kirby, they're known for having more, I guess, an expressive or explosive style. And you seem to fall into that Neil Adams uh, category of, of realistic art. And I was just wondering, um, 
well, first off, is Neil Adams someone that, that you um, were inspired by? And, and uh, what, what's your process when you go ahead and put you know, pencil down on page? Yeah, actually, I started out as a huge fan of Mort Drucker from Mad Magazine, uh, who was also one of Neil's influences. And um, I, my, I intended to do humor art, uh, maybe work for Mad Magazine um, for my career. I wasn't really a superhero fan, but I found out that there wasn't enough steady work at the time um, in humor to really make a living. And I, I figured if I was going to have a career as, as an artist, I better learn how to do dramatic comics, uh, superhero comics. And so I just picked a couple artists that I thought were the best in the business at doing that, and that was Neil Adams and John Buscema. So I studied their work uh, pretty extensively to uh, learn how to do uh, dramatic superhero comics as opposed to the, the humor stuff that I had you know, grown up doing and had intended to do. Uh, it's interesting because the styles of Neil Adams and John Buscema, they really are on two opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, and I'm just, uh, I remember how to draw comics the Marvel way. My sister uh, got that for me one Christmas and that uh, was a real eye opener in terms of storytelling. And then when you look at the work of Neil Adams, he, I think he said if superheroes existed, this is how they would look, uh, you know, referring to his artwork. Um, so it, it just seems it's an interesting uh, connection between, you know, sort of that, that dynamic realism and just pure, you know, um, I guess, uh, storytelling and and well obviously John Basima knew how to put everything together uh, but well, I, I was picking up different things from each of them I wasn't I wasn't uh, drawing the same things from both artists like you say John Basima I was looking at his storytelling how he posed his figures um, where he would use close-ups and long shots and and all all everything about his visual storytelling style what, whereas with Neil, I was more fascinated by his rendering, um, his lighting, uh, not just his ink style, but just his level of detail. Like I, I really enjoyed when Neil would ink over John Buscema's pencils. That was kind of my ideal that, that I was going for. So a lot of other artists at that time were trying to draw like Neil. I never really tried to draw like him, but I was influenced very heavily by um, the, the finished uh, uh, amount of, of detail and the kind of detail that he would bring to a, to a drawing. It's interesting uh, that you talk about detail. I was uh, doing some research before uh, our interview today, and one of the things I read on the internet, which I, I found fascinating, um, people talking about the, the way that you were able to uh, create mood, so there was a scene with Superman uh, and it's raining, and they were talking about how you were able to capture the mood and the, how the rain looked like it was a real uh, stormy night and the way the cape was billowing in the wind and the, the person who was writing this blog was just gushing over it. And then when you, <laughs> when you look at the artwork, you say, okay, you know, I, I, I've got a few things I need to, to learn here. Um, so when you're putting together uh, a page, you, you're looking at those details. Um, how long does it take you? Because from my understanding, uh, Neil Adams, although brilliant, may not have been um, always the right person for a deadline. And I might be wrong about that. Uh, but how do you balance something like that where you're working in this sort of polished style? Yeah, well, Neil actually is very fast. Uh, the reason he was very uh, not good on deadlines is because he would do advertising work that he would get paid 10 times as much for and kind of put that first and then do the comics uh, in his, you know, might call his spare time. <laughs> but he was actually very quick. Um, it takes about a day for me to pencil a page and a day for me to ink a page uh, on average. So there's some times where I would ink up to four pages in a day, uh, say over someone like Gene Colan. Um, other times uh, I, I would barely get a page done depending who the penciler was. Uh, on my own stuff, uh, usually it's all I can do to ink a page a day. And um, penciling, uh, I, I pencil a lot of breakdowns as opposed to finished pencils. Uh, on the Superman stuff, with the rain and all that, that's all done in the inking. You know, I don't do that at all in the pencil and then just trace it over in the inks. I kind of just use my penciling as a, um, as a guide to let me know what I want to do. And then all the real 
important stuff I try to save for the inking so that it's fresh when I get to the inking. I believe we. And have I, you know, I just look at um, stuff like rain and uh, see how other artists did rain and maybe pick up some tips from them and then just try to make it look like rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, you, you were mentioning breakdowns before and. Um... Uh, I believe we have a, a, an image of uh, some breakdowns that uh, Dan Jurgens did for a, a cover of one of the Superman books that you did the inks over. And I was just wondering if you could explain to our audience the difference between a, a breakdown and a finished pencil. Uh, and in this case, we have the, the cover up on the screen right now. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, different artists do breakdowns different ways, but basically the idea of a breakdown is just to have the storytelling there, not to have any blacks, not to have any rendering. Uh, not any details, just basically you're positioning the figures. Like when I when I pencil breakdowns, I was doing breakdowns for Tom Palmer ink on Star Wars for a while. And I would just do the visual storytelling. I would decide what camera angle, where the figures were going to be, how big they were going to be, what their arms and legs were going to be doing. But that's as far as I took it. And then I would leave it up to Palmer to take it from there. And same with me when I was inking Dan. Dan pencils breakdowns about the same way I do. Um, so there usually wasn't any rendering at all or any blacks at all. Um, and so I could do pretty much whatever I wanted to with it. And his his figure drawing um, and his uh, drawing in general was kind of, um, it, 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 it had kind of an unfinished quality to it where I didn't feel like I was, um, like he would mind if I took over and, and changed things. Uh, my attitude, basically whoever I was inking when I was doing breakdowns, was my job is to make this look as good as I can, not to be as faithful to the penciler as I can, because they're just breakdowns and there's still a long way to go before you get to the finished art. All right. Um, one of the other things that I was reading on the internet today um, was people applauding your everyday characters. Folks like, let's say, a Perry White or a Charles Xavier, someone who's not wearing a you know, traditional superhero costume, someone who's wearing regular clothing or maybe somebody who's not in the best shape, and how you were able to you know, make those characters seem just as alive and vibrant as you know, the heroes who were you know, fighting the, the bad guys or something like that. And I'm just wondering how you would approach um, is this something that you look at photo references for, or is it just, again, you just have an eye for it and you're able to just put those lines down on the page? Yeah, I, I attribute that to my more Drucker influence. I, I learned to draw from uh, someone who was all about caricaturing the entire figure, not just a face, and would draw all these different body types and do all these quirky things uh, in his drawings of figures that's that's what I fell in love with and what I wanted to emulate. Um, so when I got into dramatic comics, um, the hard thing for me was actually drawing these heroic, uh, more classic looking figures rather than the everyday people. Um, the everyday stuff, Perry White or, or whoever, Jimmy Olsen, all that stuff was just a piece of cake for me and, and fun for me. That's That's what I really enjoyed. And then when I had to actually draw Superman, um, I had to kind of think, well, what did the artist before me do? What did Neil do? What did Kurt Swan do? Um, how should Superman look? Um, it, it, which is, at the time, they, they've loosened up quite a bit, but at the time they had this real definite image in their mind of how they wanted Superman to look that you had to follow, but you had a little more leeway with the other characters. That's interesting. So they would they would give you uh, like a style guide or something uh, to to keep you on model, I guess. They developed a style guide around that time, um, but they basically just told me, you know, we want Superman to look uh, the way this artist did it. The artist I was thinking of was Cary Gamble, and if you know his work, he's mm -hmm. he did a lot of work on Superman, um, did a lot of the covers for the issues that I penciled on Superman, and they liked the way Cary. Uh, Drew Superman, and he was kind of a cross between John Buscema and Neil Adams as well. Um, he had a lot of the same influence as I did, so it was easy for me to just pick up on what he was doing and, and uh, kind of do it in my style. Well, it's interesting. You're, in your career, you've managed to um, be at both of the major companies at a time when they seem to be hitting their uh, creative uh, and critical 
peaks. I mean, you were at Marvel in the, the 1980s working on a book that was, uh, you know, widely read and widely uh, applauded. Uh, at the same time, the X-Men were, uh, you know, winning uh, Eagle Awards left and right, and then you had Simonson on Thor, and then you go over to DC Comics and you're working on Superman around the time when uh, that book is getting a lot of buzz, and it just seems that you've managed to be in the right place at the right time, and I'm, I'm sure that has to do with the fact that you've, you know, got a, a certain set of professional skills, but at the same time, it, it seems that um, you are involved in a lot of these situations. I'm wondering how you got yourself into them. <laughs> Um, a lot of it is just pure luck. Um, what I used to do in the beginning was I would, if I was working for Marvel, I would go over to DC because if you switched companies, they'd give you a $5 raise. So I would switch companies just to get a raise. And then I'd be working for DC for a while and I'd go back to Marvel and get another raise. So a lot of it was just looking to, for a way to make more money when I would jump from one company to another for particular projects. Um, the way I got the Superman uh, job was uh, uh, Jerry Ordway was one of the pencilers on Superman, one of the writers, and he liked what I had done on the New Mutants and um, was seeing me doing a lot of inking. And he said, you know, you really ought to do more penciling. Uh, we're, we're looking for an artist for Superman right now. You want to uh, give it a shot? And I said, sure, because Superman was the main comic I had read as a kid. And uh, it was very exciting to think that I, I could actually draw Superman in the comics. And I had been doing comics by then for 15 years, so you'd think I would be a little bit more blasé about it. But um, I was, you know, very excited and um, really wanted to do it. And luckily, the editor at uh, Mike Carlin at DC liked my work and gave me a shot. You know, being around the office in the early days, you could just... Uh, hang out and talk to the editors and be there when a job came up. And he said, I'll take that. You know, <laughs> if I hadn't been able to do that, I wouldn't have gotten that job. So one job would kind of lead into another. Um, the same editor might be editing two different books. So when you're ready to leave one series, uh, you could ask them what else they have. And they say, well, I've also got this. It's kind of how I uh, ended up on Star Wars after the New Mutants. Um, you know, just kind of working with the same editor generally is how I ended up moving on to different jobs. That's interesting. And when you when you work on a book like Superman, uh, is that something where you have a, a contract that you're going to work a certain number of issues? Or is that something where you just, you know, hey, I'm, I'm free these months and they, they kind of just, you know, bring you along for a, a while until they move on to something else or someone else? It's, it's uh, there's no set way that happens most of the time it's because the artist wants to move on. Uh, they rarely take artists off the books um, because they don't put them on there in the first place unless they can do the job. So unless they just can't keep a deadline, they might take them off a book for that reason. Or if they're injured or, or ill health or whatever, they might have to take them off a book. Um, but generally, the artist is just ready to, to do something else. Um, so when I was doing Superman... There was no contract saying I'm going to do this for a certain amount of time. I just was doing it uh, and really wanted to ink my own pencils, but I wasn't fast enough to do that every month. And so even though I had some good inkers working with me, it wasn't the look I wanted my art to have. And I, I just kept thinking, I you know, I really want to ink myself. So after a couple of years of working with a couple of different inkers, um, I just told him, look, you know, I want to do something else where I can actually ink my own pencils. And I did do a little, like three issues in a row that I penciled and inked on Superman, but I just couldn't keep up the schedule. So then I did an annual after I left the series that I penciled and inked. And then, uh, you know, something came up over at Marvel. So I jumped back over to Marvel. As I recall, you, you also were the inker for the, um, uh, was it Craven's Last Hunt over at Marvel around that time, uh, which I remember being one of those books that, for, you know, is a, a big event when events still meant something. I think those books came out every two weeks. And I think towards the end of that uh, series, you ended up taking more of a, a, a finishing role rather than just doing straight inks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, that job came about because of uh, Mike Zeck and I just being friends. And he liked my inking over his pencils, and I loved inking his pencils. 
Um, so when he got the assignment to do that, he asked me, he, he was usually working with John Beatty, was kind of his regular inker. And I think John maybe was busy on another project at the time. Um, and Mike asked me to do uh, that series. And I jumped on it. I, th I thought it was a really cool idea. And um, I liked the idea that they were going to split it up between all the titles. And like you say, come up, come out every couple weeks instead of doing it all, the whole storyline in just one, one of the uh, Spider-Man titles and once a month. So it was a new thing that they hadn't tried before. Um, kind of a really special deal. And Mike started out doing really tight, the tightest pencils I'd ever seen him do. Uh, he did all six covers all at once, and then the first couple issues, uh, tight pencils. Um, even though he knew, you know, he could trust me on the inks. And then as he started getting behind on the deadline because he was trying to do such tight pencils, he just started loosening up and loosening up until the last couple issues were just very loose breakdowns. And he just said, just keep going with that same look. And he, he trusted me to be able to do that. Um, so I just took over more on the, on those last issues, but you know tried to keep it looking the same. Mm -hmm. um, I just was wondering. Uh, I, we were scheduled to do the interview last week, and then something had come up. You said you were working on, working on a piece for Marvel, and I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit about what you're working on lately. I know that you've done um, some. Uh, I think they're educational books. Uh, I saw on your website, and I was just wondering what work you've been you've been doing recently. Uh, not educational books. I did an uh, alphabet book for kids called Superhero ABC uh, a few years ago, and I go to schools and talk about that, and um, it's still selling well. Uh, it's, I'm amazed it's uh, still around in, in print after all these years. I did it way back in 2006. No, last week uh, was the week before the New York Comic Con, and I had some uh, commissions that fans that were going to be at the Comic Con had asked me to do in advance and I'd been too busy to get to them and so I was madly trying to get those done before the commission because they were going to be there in one case from another country and it was their one chance to get it without me having to mail it overseas where it might get lost or damaged or they might you know when when you mail something over to France say there's a fee they have to pay on top of the regular postage to receive it um, so it was important for me to get that done I've got one of the things, I, I don't have a scan of that because I had to give that to him and just didn't get around to making a scan, but this is one of the things I was working on last week. Um, if you can see that, it's a blank cover, a sketch cover they're called. They make these, uh, it's a regular comic inside, the regular story, but they put a blank cover on there for the artist to, to draw whatever they want on there. And uh, this is something I was doing for one of the fans. Um, X-Men and a Sentinel. And I got this other one that I didn't get finished. I had to abandon it because I just did, I ran out of time penciling a, uh, another Sentinel with Cannonball knocking his head off. That's amazing. So uh, commissions seem like they are a way a lot of artists are able to you know, fill in those, those times in between uh, a regular assignment. Um, and it also seems like it's a great way for you to connect with fans who have always wanted to um, you know, have that cover on their wall, and now they have their own uh, unique copy of it. Um, so when you're working on a commission like that, is, is this something that, um, that you are able to uh, reimagine the cover for, the, art, uh, for the, uh, the commissioner, I guess? Or is this something where you, yeah. you kind of keep it at, you know, people, note for note? A lot of people ask me to recreate one of my covers as a commission uh, because they can't afford the original if they can even find it for sale. A lot of those covers are going for thousands of dollars now, um, and so they asked me to just redo it, basically. Sometimes they want changes to it. Um, sometimes they want it exactly like the original cover. Um, so commissions uh, are mainly what I'm doing now. I've been working in comics for over 40 years and still do occasional uh, things for the comic publishers. Um, I did a little Spider-Man job last year, and I do some variant covers. I'm uh, going to be doing more of those. But I don't really look for steady work in comics anymore. I enjoy doing commissions, and I've got a long list of commissions waiting for me to do. I can set my own price and my own deadline. 
So it's actually um, better for me as, as the artist uh, to do commissions than to work in comics where I've got to rush, rush, rush to meet their deadlines because the writer or the penciler or whoever ahead of me um, missed their deadline and it shortens my time. You know, there's all kinds of uh, problems when you work in comics that you don't have doing commissions. So I actually prefer doing commissions. Well, I see we have about a little less than three minutes left uh, of our show. And I just wanted to find out if you preferred the Marvel method or the full script method. I much prefer the Marvel method. Uh, most That's how I've worked most of my career. The full script method is very inhibiting, I think, for the artist. Um, most artists have a, have a better visual sense than writers. Writers are good at dialogue and um, thinking up stories, but the actual uh, way to show that story, they're generally not as good at, um, and they tend to want to have people standing around talking too much. Whereas if you just have a plot, the Marvel way, um, you can decide how many panels to put on a page or where to start the next page or what panel to make bigger uh, to show some action or whatever. So it gives the artist, who I think is, is better equipped uh, in those areas, more leeway to make it a more exciting story. Well, that's that's uh, interesting because I find that most artists that I talk to always seem to prefer the, the Marvel method. Um, and then the, our last question, I see we have about a minute left of the show. Um, hitting a deadline every month, how do you balance, uh, or how did you balance that monthly deadline? Uh, is this something where you work from home or do you have to get a studio space so you can just, you know, like I'm going to work and don't bother me, that sort of mentality? I'm pretty disciplined. Um, so I just say, look, I got to get this done. I've got to do a page a day. Sorry, I can't do that right now. I got to work. Um, so it, I've worked at home most of my career. I used to work in a studio with some other artists and I found I got less done because you're talking to the other artist and looking at their work, and um, uh, it's easier for me to keep a deadline when I'm at working at home. All right, well, thank you so much. We've been talking with Bob McLeod. Uh, you've been watching Comic Culture. We hope to see you again for another episode.